Hi, my name is Jeremy and I'm here at Azul making darkroom photograms. My darkroom tent. Um, so this is, it looks like a standard camping tent, um, but actually it actually has, it's a, a Coleman tent and they call it darkroom technology. So if you go to, if you Google Coleman tent darkroom, there's actually tents. You can actually see over here, there should be a logo. See that logo right there? It says darkroom oh, yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. Basically on the inside of this tent, there's kind of a layer that has like, a, it's like a black coating. So when you zip it up without doing anything extra to it, it reduces the light that will come in to about 90%. So only, you know, 10% of natural light is actually coming into the tent when you open up this from the box. So I need it to be 100 though. So the 90 is good. So what I did is I took this uh, tarp that I bought at Lowe's and I just draped it over the tent and then I put the rain fly over top of that and that is really close to 100% light tight. There's a couple little moments, like you might see these little clamps at the bottom, where the bottom of that tent will actually leak a little bit of light from the bottom. Like actually. the stitching or something. So I'll just roll it up and clamp it, and that will take care of that. So then when you walk into the tent, I'll have my uh, four tra my three trays of chemicals, and then I have a tray of water. Um, and basically I will let, I will take um, things that I have acquired, like here's a, a bunch of stuff that I've been using. Mm. So basically my process is, say I want to make a composition using these two things, okay? So I'll have my paper, I'll be in the tent with it zipped up, and it's completely dark in there. And then I'll take this item, and I'll lay it on to a piece of paper, which is photosensitive, and it just looks like a normal piece of paper that has a, like a shiny coating to it. Um, so then I'll lay it on the piece of paper like this, and then I'll take a flashlight, just a little tiny little LED flashlight, and I'll kind of step back and I'll expose it for just, you know, two or three seconds. And then I'll pick it up, and then I might take another item, put it down again, and I might do the same thing. So that's been double exposed now. And then I'll take that piece of paper, which nothing has happened to it. So we did flash light onto it, but you have to actually put it in the chemicals for the image to actually show up. So then my first tray is a developer chemical. So I'm going to pick, put that piece of paper in the developer chemical, and you'll actually see this black and white image form. And then once it looks how I want it to look, I'm going to pull it out with some tongs, let it drip a little bit, and then I'll put it into my next tray, which is called the stop. And the stop is to stop the developer. Ew. So you have to make sure you're really watching your piece and the developer, because if, if you leave it in there too long, it'll just turn black. So you have to really watch it. So that's why I have that mechanics flashlight to really help me um, gauge when it's time to take it out. So then I'll let it sit in the stop for a couple minutes. You don't really need to let it sit that long, but I just, to be careful, I do. Um, and then I'll pull it out of the stop and then I'll put it into another chemical called the fixer Which is kind of like a conditioner for your hair um, Where it'll just kind of even out the tones and make it look nice And it'll be in that for a couple minutes and then I'll just put it in a tub of water And I can just let it sit there for hours if, if needed While I and I'll do probably 12 in a row like that oh, cool. So I don't go in and out of the tent I bring all my plants inside my flashlights inside so I'll be in my tent for about an hour, um, just making a dozen of these in a row and experiment. Was that hard to get the good rhythm on that? Cause that all sounds, to do all that in the dark, it sounds like you had to. It's very difficult. So when I first got here at Azul um, this summer, I brought a bunch of small pieces of paper with me to get that rhythm. Okay. Because it's also like, where are things? Like I have, cause it's so dark in there. I have to put my flashlights in the same place. I, ha I have to wear things that have multiple pockets because I'll just keep things on me because I can't find them inside the tent. Um, and you're right about getting that rhythm, um, I think is really important. So I always, I always 
do a bunch of eight by tens at first. Um, like I think I showed y'all those two little fern leaves that were an eight by 10. That was just to confirm, I know what I'm doing. I know how the tent works. I know how the chemicals work and I've mixed them correctly. Um, and then a couple days later is when I start making bigger works that are more complex and have multiple exposures. Would the main difference between this and darkroom photography be that instead of plants, they're using the negative with that machine? I don't know what it's Sure, called. it's called an enlarger. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so, there, so that's a good question. So what I'm making are contact prints. So I don't need a negative and I don't need a, a, a projector or an enlarger that's shining through that negative, but the paper that a traditional photograph is developed onto, that's the exact paper I'm using. Yeah. And the exact chemicals that in a traditional photograph they use, I'm using those too. But I, what I've done is stripped out the negative, I've stripped out film, I've stripped out the enlarger, where me stepping back and using the flashlight and shining light on an object, that makes me basically the enlarger. Yeah. So funny. I'm the machine that is shining the light onto it. Um, you know, so it gets a little confusing when you look at it. Some people think it's like x-rays or they think it's film, but they can't figure out how it could be film. Um, but basically it's just called a contact print. And a lot of people are probably familiar with like cyanotypes with the blue and the white. It's basically the same process except cyanotypes. You do it outside with full exposure of the sun. Oh. And with these types of things, you do them inside with no exposure of light and you control the light. But basically it's the same process and it has a very, they have a very similar look to them as well. Another, uh, well, how do you compare that to like pinhole camera? Because when I first saw you, I thought that's what this was, a giant sure. pinhole camera, but no. It is exactly the same as a pinhole camera, except so some people think I'm, I'm doing a camera obscura where, so say instead of using a flashlight, what if I poked a hole in the tent and I allowed the light to come in and then I could maybe close the hole. And that, that's how a lot of people think I do it. That's way harder than I can pull off it using a tent. Uh, camera obscura is kind of hard. Um, so basically you could turn this tent into a, a huge pinhole camera if you wanted to, um, but using a flashlight is just so much easier for me. Okay. Um, but that would be a fun experiment as for children, especially to just learn um, how light actually works it is actually create their own camera obscura because um, you don't have to just make a pinhole camera this big. You could make a pinhole, pinhole camera that can fit yourself inside of it too. Uh -huh. So when did you start with this photography? Well, um, I think it was back in like 2008. I was a high school teacher in Savannah, Georgia, and I had never done darkroom photography before. And my seniors that year were desperate to do darkroom. I don't know what they saw something, they got really curious about it. So um, one of my colleagues actually helped me find a bunch of enlargers and basic equipment for students to experiment with. So we went and got that and I just said, here you go, seniors, show me what you can figure out. Mm. So they were experimenting, they did pinhole cameras, they did contact prints, and they showed me how this stuff works. And they were doing basic things like doing hand prints and finding simple objects like pencils and scissors and doing the same kind of style. And then it just kind of dawned on me like, I actually think this is super cool. So they taught it to me. And then I started doing it as my regular like art practice. So now I've been in tons of exhibitions, solo shows, all kinds of stuff, residencies now, all because my students, you know, inspired and actually introduced it to me. So you're more of a, a teacher as opposed to an artist in that kind I am. Of professional whatever kind of way. I call myself a teaching artist okay. where I do have, um, I, I do have uh, a pretty active exhibition record and I love making art. I'd consider myself an artist, but I myself, I am a, a professor of art education at Tennessee Tech University. So that is primarily my job is to teach teachers. So my students are training to be art teachers and museum educators, um, and that's my main job. And then I teach them these types of techniques every year. Um, and then I usually work a lot over the summer 
um, doing my own stuff here. During the school year, I don't do as much, uh, but that's why I like to come to Azul, because then I don't have to worry about work and other obligations. I can just be here experimenting. And how did you find out about Azul? Man, it was probably, I think, like 2018 or 2019. I think I was just cruising the internet looking for opportunities that were within my region. Um, and because doing an artist residency really far away, I don't, it's hard to fly with all this stuff because I'm, I actually bring you know, all my own chemistry and everything and all this stuff just takes up too, too much room. So was there, were there places that I could drive within three or four hours um, and that were in just beautiful locations? And Azul kept popping up as like the best option. So I applied back in 2019 um, and got in. And I have, I have made the best artwork I've ever made here in 2019. It got into all kinds of shows. I had a solo show that was based off of the work that I did here. Um, so obvious, I wanted to come back and keep experimenting. Well, um, do you have any last words? Ooh, wow. Um, I guess my last words would be, as as an artist, especially as emerging artists, try to really develop your own your own process, your own practice because then there's endless possibilities. So I'm not trying to replicate anybody. I, I'm not even trying to make a specific piece at all. I'm just trying to keep experimenting with new processes, new, new tents, new, new ideas, and then magically the product will happen. Um, so just trying to come up with those unique processes that fit how you work, um, that really utilize the things that you're interested in. So like I get to just walk around this property and collect things and then I get to make these cool photographic prints in this custom design tent. It's like so fulfilling and I'm intrinsically motivated to do it. Um, so just keep um, trying to develop your own process, I think. Awesome, thanks so much. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm from Cookville, Tennessee. Um, and I'm here at Azul as a resident artist, and I'm exploring darkroom photography, actually using a tent outside. So here are a bunch of my pieces that I've been experimenting with on this table and this table here. And basically my process is I walk around the grounds of Azul and I just collect things that I think, uh, collect organic things that have interesting shapes and interesting forms, interesting textures, it might be a specific type of leaf, it might be a rock, it, you know, anything that kind of strikes my fancy. Um, and then I'll collect all those things in a bag. Here's a bunch of stuff that I collected today in this bag. And then I go outside, I have a tent that's actually um, outside here on the little patio. And I've designed it so that it's light tight. So I've actually sprayed it with a special um, like flex seal spray. I also have different tarps and things, so then when you walk inside of the tent, it is almost perfectly light tight. And then I actually have a bunch of these containers that look like this, and I actually make like a traditional dark room inside of the tent. So I can actually walk into the tent, I can have these containers um, filled with eco-friendly uh, dark room chemicals, and then I can zip it up behind me and it's completely dark inside. Wow. And one of the things I can do to see is I have this flashlight, which is a mechanics flashlight. And what I've done is I've duct taped a safe filter to it. So when I turn it on, I don't know if you can see that, but an orange light will actually show up. That means I can actually, this is how I see inside of the tent, and I'll shine this on my materials and my paper, just like you would use a safe light in a dark room, you know, the red safe light. And then what happens, like here's a simple one, is I'll collect some ferns and then I'll just lay them on a piece of photosensitive paper that just looks plain white. I'll lay the fern leaves on it and then I'll take a little cheap flashlight that I get from like the dollar store and I'll just turn it on for three seconds and then turn it off. Three so seconds, that's it. It's just a quick exposure. It's, 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 I just do like one one thousand, two one thousand and then click it off. And then I'll just put it into my individual trays. So just like in a traditional right dark room. So then here's a bigger version. And this is a double exposure here. 
So these are um, some plants that I found actually behind, um, I don't know, behind that little cabin like building. Oh, uh, that's up on the woodshed, hill. right? Yeah, um, so I was back, back back there and I collected some of these really, really cool plants. But first, before I even put the plants on the paper, I see these like kind of like cloud-like forms. I actually took some of, and it's kind of behind the sink over here, there's a big pile of just old um, wall insulation. Because Azul is constantly adding on to things here and has their building projects here. So I took a bunch of that building insulation, put it on the plain white piece of paper and exposed it. Then I removed the insulation and then I put the plants down and then exposed it. So then I put it into the chemicals after that. So it's been exposed twice to create this type of image. And then you can get more complicated. Um, I think I can show this one. Huh. This one's kind of hard to make, maybe hard to see, but. Um, so I think this is about the same process with the double exposure, but I think this is a quadruple exposure. Okay. So one of the cool things I did with this is after I exposed it a couple times, I put it inside the tray. So I'm actually, watching it kind of form and then what happened is I noticed there was a spot right here that I didn't really like so I took some rocks that I already had collected earlier that day I put the rocks directly into the tray with the chemicals and then I took a flashlight and exposed it again while this is actually laying in the chemical tray that's probably a huge no-no for any darkroom photographer because you're contam you're basically contaminating your chemicals. Um, you're putting like rocks inside of your trays, which is not like a best practice, you know. But it creates these really interesting shapes that were were not there before. Makes it look 3D. Yeah, and then um, another example of this one is maybe easier to tell is um, on this fern right here. This fern was not originally there in the composition, but I noticed there was a big missing part. Like I, like, oh crap, I missed, I missed a whole section of my paper. So then I laid a, this nice fern into the chemical bath with the paper as it's developing. And then I took a flashlight and like zapped it. And you can actually see it kind of looks like spray paint, like a stencil. And that I'm just zapping it into it while it's in the actual tray. Oh, wow. Right. And then a more traditional one, like all of that's kind of complicated. This is a more traditional one where I found two plants that were basically identical, laid them on the paper, and then um, exposed it. And then I noticed there was a lot of white spaces down here. Um, so I did a little bit of that uh, wall insulation down there. It looks like clouds. Yeah, so it looks like clouds. What is that? So this is... I So... Not only do I like to forage things that are like on the property, um, but I found this like telephone cord. Um, and there, I think it was by the refrigerator here in the basement at Azul. And what I did was I wrapped that cord around a feather that I found hmm. and then oh, that's a feather. exposed it. Of course it is. <laughs> and then I just moved it after that. So I moved it and then exposed it again. And I've never really used a plastic cord like this before, so I kept it in the tent, so I'm gonna ex experiment with it tomorrow. Um, but that's why there's two feathers, is because it's a double exposure. There's really only one feather. Oh, interesting. Wow. Um, and then like, here's another one too. Um, I really like, like the angrier the plant, the better for me, because I like all these little edges and how some things can have this really nice highlight and really illuminate, and then some things fade back into kind of a shadow. Um, thorny, right? Yeah, very thorny. Mm -hmm. And that happens when, when most people do prints like this, they're called contact prints. Most people, like if I just put, um, like if I just put my hand down, mm -hmm. you could expose that and it would create a handprint. I kind of, I find that boring. So I like to put things that are very three dimensional, like the wall insulation, like this kind of very angry plant that has things, it's very radial, you know, things are going in all kinds of different directions on this plant. So when you sit it down, you don't really, you don't even, you don't even know what the image is gonna look like. But if I just put my hand down 
you and exposed it, I know exactly what it's going to look like. So then that robs me of the pleasure of the process. Mm -hmm. So all of these pieces, um, I truly have no idea what they're going to look like. And I'm excited when they turn out, but when they don't turn out, I often will just kind of cut them up. I'll use them in collages. I might cut out one section and send a, send a postcard, mm -hmm. or you can literally just cut out a portion of that and write on the back and mail it if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's not really about trying to make some masterpiece. It's just trying to create a process that's unique that I can uh, explore nature. I can be very mobile with my darkroom. Um, that's the idea of having a darkroom tent is that I can put it up anywhere I want to um, and then I can have a, 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 like a pop-up instant darkroom. Mm -hmm.